Chapter 7 The World Outside In May 1963, Zulfikar Ali Bhutto, then Minister for External Affairs of Pakistan, declared, Pakistan has arrived at peaceful settlement with all neighboring countries, like China, Nepal, Afghanistan and Burma, except, unfortunately, India, which refuses to make the necessary adjustments to bring lasting peace to the subcontinent. I hope we can give undivided attention to one question which Pakistan faces, solution of the Kashmir problem. This quote remains relevant even today. The political idea of Pakistan, propagated from 1940 on, and which bore quick, if blighted, fruit in 1947, had roots in regions which, as we heard at the start of this narrative, had connections to the outside world through the seas and by land. The Arabian Sea, the Persian Gulf, and the Bay of Bengal, on the one hand, and the Silk Road, the Khyber Pass, and the Great Trunk Road, on the other, had served as corridors for ideas, goods, and armies for thousands of years. Contemporary political imaginations, Cold War geopolitical relations, and post-Cold War globalization are variations on older themes. However, there has been one important change. While previously this ancient land was seen as one of opportunity to which people were drawn, today it is mostly the opposite. Love thy neighbour? Within two months and ten days of partition, in October 1947, the governments of India and Pakistan were at an undeclared war over one of its items of unfinished business, the then princely state of Jammu and Kashmir. Pakistan feared that Jammu and Kashmir, among the largest, most strategically located of regions, would accede to India. Communal relations in the state were difficult. An unpopular Hindu Maharaja of the Dogra dynasty ruled over a Muslim-majority population whose most popular leader nursed an ambition of regional self-determination. Theoretically free at the end of British paramountcy, 1858-1947, the 550-plus princely states in the subcontinent were effectively at the mercy of the rising tide of mass populism on the one hand, and the relevant imperatives of their geography, demography, military and ideology on the other. The case of Jammu and Kashmir was especially sensitive. For Pakistan, it was difficult to imagine a border area with a Muslim-majority population belonging to India, given the two-nation theory and its logical conclusion in the partition of British India. For India, by the same token, it was important to ideologically refute Pakistan's raison d'etre by showing that India was a country for all communities. The Kashmiri ruler, veering between dreams of independence and declaration for India, saw sections of his population rise against him, soon aided and abetted by tribesmen entering from Pakistani territory. As he sought military assistance from India, New Delhi extracted the political price of accession to India and Karachi responded accordingly, triggering the first India-Pakistan war. Amidst this power play, the Kashmiri people, living in the famed Vale of Srinagar, but also in other regions like Jammu, Poonch and Gilgit-Baltistan, were caught up in this India-Pakistan binary. Since then, stereotypes of Kashmir's scenic beauty, torn between the two rivals competing for the territory, have set the tropes of this dispute be it in academia or fiction, such as Salman Rushdie's novel Shalimar, the Clown. This has thwarted an understanding of Kashmiri nationalism while not ushering in any kind of peace, with or without honour, in the region. Periods of surface calm have been underlain by passages of occupation and challenges to it. Meanwhile, on the map, the ceasefire line of 1949 turned into the line of control of 1972, and on the ground... Kashmir remains trifurcated, with the Kashmiri people split between an India-administered, a Pakistan-held, and a China-controlled triangle. Neither of the principal parties has dared to hold a plebiscite in any part of the state. This denial of national self-determination to 12 million people militarized by India and 4 million people by Pakistan has seen demands of azadi, freedom, on both sides, albeit more in India. After successive waves of uprising from the late 1980s to the late 2010s, on the 5th of August 2019, the government of India, under the Hindu nationalist government of the Bharatiya Janata Party, BJP, revoked the state's special status and reduced it to directly controlled union territories. 
The government of Pakistan, meanwhile, has its own arrangements for the part of Kashmir under its administration, as well as the northern areas adjacent to Chinese Xinjiang, called Gilgit Baltistan. Greater interrogation of these Kashmirs with India and Pakistan is afoot, which papers over the fact that this is one of the most militarized regions in the world. India's grave human rights abuses in the Valley of Kashmir for at least the past 30 years have been met with Pakistan's perennial Janus-faced approach to the issue. Covert support and overt rhetoric for helping the angry young men perpetuate their conflict, but towards whose desired end? The toxic mix of elevated nationalism and religion, but also petty political dishonesty, has meant that the Kashmir Valley may well be on its way to becoming a bigger version of the Gaza Strip, or the West Bank, if not Tibet. The administrative shifts taking place are clear, with the Indian state's desire for a form of settler colonialism paralleling the demographic change achieved in Tibet by the Chinese state since 1959 and by the Israeli state in Palestine. Four wars, 1947, 1965, 1971, 1999, almost daily border skirmishes, tit-for-tat meddling in insurgencies, Kashmir, Balochistan, Indian Punjab, and the hyper-masculine nationalism sweeping across the subcontinent see majoritarian loyalty to these authoritarian states. If the end of empire was far from clean, then the emergence of the Cold War in the region was equally messy. Pakistan courted the USA before and under Ayub Khan in the 1950s to 1960s, while Zulfikar Bhutto increasingly looked towards Mao's China and the Organization of Islamic Conference in the 1970s. Zia received a godsend opportunity in the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, which renewed US interest in Pakistan after 1979, while the Saudi royal house, long close to the USA, was also keen to nip in the bud any varieties of socialism, no matter if Islamic. Zia's vision for Pakistan was the perfect fit for the Saudis, and what emerged was an alliance of religious parties, strategic interests, and despotic leaderships all bankrolled by American and petrodollars. All this was simultaneously strained and strengthened by the rise of the Taliban and Al-Qaeda in the 1990s to 2000s. Since 2000, Pakistan has been hyphenated increasingly less with India and more with its other neighbour, Afghanistan. They share a 1,500-mile border that in parts is soft and porous with overlapping ethnicities and socio-cultural practices. Much more than the mid-20th century Radcliffe line with India, Pakistan's political relationship with Afghanistan has been bedeviled by the late 19th century Durand line, a colonial artefact that has been contested by successive Afghan governments. They refused to accept the loss of territories east of the line and the consequent severing of the people's ties across this political boundary, and in 1947 Afghanistan was the only country to vote against the entry of Pakistan to the UN. The idea of a greater Pakhtunistan lived on for a while, carrying the legacy of the troubled frontier, a colonial inheritance. Significantly, Pakistan has also been a refuge, hosting one of the largest refugee populations in the world. Afghans first started to flee en masse when Soviet forces stormed the Tajbeg Palace, Kabul, and assassinated the Afghan president Hafizullah Amin in December 1979. Eleven years later, there were an estimated 3.7 million Afghans in Pakistan. The civil war that followed the withdrawal of the Soviet troops and saw the Taliban take over government in Kabul by 1996 only enlarged this population, with accompanying challenges to house, feed and employ them. Pakistan, along with Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates, UAE, was one of the first countries to recognize Taliban rule, and security studies literature abounds with descriptions of the Pakistani state's run with the hare and hunt with the hounds role in its rise. Any repatriation of refugees was halted by the events of 9-11 and the War on Terror from 2003. By then, the UNHCR estimated that 5 million Afghan refugees were in refugee camps in Pakistan. Of late, Pakistan's relationship with Afghanistan has waxed and waned, affected by American intentions, Indian interventions, and the investments of both. Perhaps the greatest legacy of this was Zia's survival in power until 1988, given the Americans' need for him to create a Vietnam for the Red Army in Afghanistan. Fifteen years later, US troops would be back in Afghanistan, and this time among the beneficiaries 
would be another Pakistan general turned president, Pervez Musharraf. In this repeating cycle of history, the ultimate price was paid by the people and places in Pakistan. The country was flooded by nefarious funds, weapons and narcotics, often travelling between the seaport of Karachi and the gateway to the north, Peshawar. These cities have remained a hub for political, ethnic, religious and drug-related violence, in which arms travelling to and from Afghanistan found a happy home. Apart from creating a culture of normalised everyday violence, the resulting volatility has weakened the economic position of Pakistan by inevitably deterring foreign investment. While courting the West, chiefly Americans, but also the British, from within or without the confines of the Commonwealth, Pakistan remains one of the biggest recipients of UK aid, Pakistan has also had a close relationship with communist China. This so-called all-weather friendship was formally forged in 1963, when the two countries signed a border agreement delimiting the territory along the Karakoram mountain range. China has ever since proved to be a reliable friend in need, especially when the USA and the UK have not. After all, their alliance has as much, if not more, to do with countering India than with anything else. It was no coincidence that the 1963 agreement came soon after India was defeated in its 1962 war with China. Slightly prior to this, a partnership had started in 1959 to build the Karakoram Highway, linking Kashgar in Xinjiang to Islamabad by the Hunjarab Pass, which follows the path of the ancient Silk Road. The rather scenic highway was fully completed in 1978 and opened to the public in its entirety in 1986. The present Chinese government's Belt and Road Initiative builds, in many respects, on this example, with a larger-scale resurrection of the Silk Road through this region. At the South Asian heart of BRI is the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, CPEC, which envisages Chinese investments in Pakistan amounting to $62 billion. Through this project, China will help in a wide spectrum of infrastructure projects, from power, electricity, to road and rail transport. The centrepiece is the development of the Deep Sea Gwada port on the far southwestern coast of Balochistan. The administrative control of the port is handled by Pakistan's Maritime Secretary, while the operational control is held by the little-known China Overseas Port Holding Company. This provides China with an access to the Arabian Sea, Persian Gulf, and the Indian Ocean. In the making since 1998, work started in 2002 and was completed four years later. In many ways, it was the launchpad for the CPEC, which took off over 2013 to 2015. These substantial investments in Pakistan are crucial because Pakistan's economy has suffered significantly since 2001 and foreign investment in the country has dropped dramatically due to security concerns. After the election of President Trump, US assistance and aid programs declined substantially. This drop has been countered by investments from the Saudi crown, which has pledged $20 billion, and the UAE, pledging $3 billion. While Beijing has continued to be the all-weather friend, the political price to be paid is also obvious. Most visible is the silence of Islamabad on the question of the treatment of the Muslim Uyghurs in Xinjiang, China. Pakistan's refusal to criticise Beijing on their persecution is in contrast to its sharp criticism of human rights abuses in Kashmir, Palestine and Myanmar. The Pakistani Diaspora the overseas Pakistani community number around 9 million people, and half of those are based in the Gulf states. The UK has the largest Pakistani diaspora community outside the Gulf, with over a million people, while substantial numbers also live in the United States, 500,000 plus, and Canada, 200,000 plus. These groups have emerged from different waves of migration and settlement, often reflecting and responding to colonialism the world wars, and regional changes. Given that this is one of the largest diaspora populations in the world, it has curiously drawn little academic research. This may be partly because the earlier phases of migration, until the 1970s, were often understood collectively within a South Asian context, while the post-1970s numbers have increasingly been incorporated within a global Muslim diaspora. But Pakistanis overseas are as diverse as their country, and make a big contribution to the Pakistani economy via their remittances. 
The Pakistani diaspora has developed largely since the 1970s, but smaller numbers also migrated following independence in 1947. Post-war reconstruction and labor shortages in the UK were an important factor in attracting men from the Commonwealth, including small numbers of Pakistanis. Equally important were professionals such as doctors. However, the majority of the Pakistani diaspora in the UK comes from Mirpur, a small district in its part of Kashmir. There has been a history of migration from this area since the 1940s, but following the construction of the Mangla Dam in the early 1960s, there was a sharp increase. This was partly due to the displacement caused by the construction of the dam, but also because the British contractor behind the dam was assisting the displaced residents. This cheap labour started life in manufacturing and shifted into the service sector, or, as Verinda Kalra put it in his influential work From Textile Mills to Taxi Ranks, in northern British towns and in the 1970s to 1980s, sent back remittances that enabled Mirpur to prosper much more than the rest of Pakistan. Brand new markets catered for diaspora taste buds. Grand houses were built to display the newly acquired televisions and videos. All this in a small, remote area adjacent to North Punjab in rural Pakistan. With Mirpur being in the politically contested territory of Kashmir, there are layers to identity politics here. Mirpuris often identify themselves ethnically as Kashmiris, amidst whom is a strand that would like to see a nation of Kashmir independent of India and Pakistan. Their migration story is thus connected to wider questions of competing diasporic identity and Kashmiri nationalism. Away from Britain, the Gulf has been the choice destination for the vast majority of Pakistanis. The oil boom of the 1970s propelled the old seafaring trade links across the Arabian Sea and through the Persian Gulf. People from large swathes across the subcontinent responded to the demand for labour in Saudi Arabia and the UAE. Many Pakistanis were eager to leave the grim economic conditions and mass nationalisation of industry by Bhutto and were lured by the construction and developments taking place in the Gulf. The new middle class in Pakistan can be considered in part a creation of this group and its financial injections into a fragile economy, enabling urban centres and rural development. This class is characterised by their disposable income and conspicuous consumption, reflected in the growth of restaurants, malls, multiplexes etc. in urban cities, and also a concomitant religious revivalism and spiritual piety. In 2019, the value of their remittances was $21.8 billion, with $5 billion from Saudi Arabia alone. Imran Khan's government, capitalising on the PTI's popularity in the diaspora, has been encouraging Pakistanis overseas to remit back home to save the cash-strapped economy and to build Naya Pakistan. The relationship between Pakistan and Saudi Arabia has only gone from strength to strength. In intergovernmental matters, the kingdom has offered Pakistan generous economic assistance, and in recent years, the two countries have been cooperating militarily too. The best illustration of this is the appointment in 2017 of General Rahil Sharif, Pakistan's former Chief of Army Staff, 2013 to 2016. As the Commander-in-Chief of the Islamic Military Counter-Terrorism Coalition of 39 countries, with its headquarters in Riyadh. As already noted, Saudi Arabia has had great impact on the religious and cultural landscape of Pakistan, added to its substantial funding of madrasas, religious schools, that are closely aligned to a more puritanical version of Islam, a hali hadith, practiced there, is the symbolism of the iconic Shah Faisal Mosque, the largest in Pakistan, funded with $120 million from the kingdom in 1976 and named after King Faisal. Indeed, the design of the mosque by the Turkish architect Vedat Dolake pays homage to the Arabian Bedouin tent. Then, there is the renaming of colonial Lyalpur as Faisalabad in 1979, after King Faisal. Faisalabad is not only one of the leading commercial centres in Pakistan, but also functions as a hub for entrepreneurs and overseas workers. This relationship with Saudi Arabia, complementing the changes in Pakistan after the independence of Bangladesh, saw the Islamic Dao sail away from its subcontinental mooring. However, this assertion of a stronger Islamic identity of the Saudi brand has meant tetchy relations with the neighbouring Shia-majority Iran, as well as the more Europeanized Turkey. Whether it was the Iran-Pakistan natural gas pipeline, 
continuing into India, or the popularity of Turkish television dramas in Pakistani drawing rooms, amending the text of the penal code along Sunni Sharia lines, is one thing. Ignoring a near neighbour and a more distant but long-standing influence, Turkish law in subcontinental politics goes back to the Khilafat movement of a century ago, is quite another. Furthermore, relations with the kingdom have not always been smooth. Over half a million Pakistanis have been deported from Saudi Arabia between 2012 and 2019 over expired visas and other offences. In September 2019, Riyadh abruptly decided to reject postgraduate medical degrees from Pakistan. And in any case, working conditions in the Arabian Peninsula have never been appealing. There are numerous accounts of employers withholding passports, of unpaid wages and poor working conditions. Despite all this, approximately 2.5 million Pakistanis live in Saudi Arabia. The allure of making it abroad to escape the immediate economic hardships at home is too strong. The price that such escape can entail was brought home in the 2013 film Zinda Bahag, Run Alive, directed by Fajad Nabi and Minu Gur, which portrayed the issue of illegal migration painfully through the experiences of three friends each of whom tried to cross borders illegally with the risk of death if they did not succeed. The film, representing the re-emergence of independent cinema, was Pakistan's official entry for the Best Foreign Language Film at the Academy Awards that year. The changing contours of the cinematic portrayal of Pakistan poignantly capture changing perceptions and identities, those of self and the other. The comedy drama East is East, directed by Damien O'Donnell, 1999, Set in Salford, UK, in 1971, brings to life the story of one family headed by a Pakistani man and the challenges of his children growing up in Britain. By contrast, the 2012 film The Reluctant Fundamentalist, directed by Mira Nair, based on Mohsin Hamid's novel, is a political thriller depicting the conflict between the American dream and a re-evaluation of self and its sovereignty in an American society that treats any Muslim with suspicion. The inside-outside dichotomy of contemporary Pakistan is that of an increasingly Islamic country in an increasingly Islamophobic world. Ziauddin Sadar, the British Pakistani scholar, suggests that Pakistanis have a love-hate relationship with America. There are those who want to migrate there, and at the same time, the USA is also perceived as a meddling villain, especially since the War on Terror began. Of course, Pakistan has also received significant sums in American aid over the decades. Although the character Shangiz in Hamid's novel goes back to Pakistan, the real population of Pakistanis in the USA has only continued to grow. From 30,000 in 1980, it is now over half a million. Pakistanis in the USA mostly come from cities such as Lahore, Karachi, Rawalpindi, Faisalabad, Hyderabad and Peshawar. Most have settled in New York, New Jersey and California, seeking better opportunities across white-collar sectors. This group is different from those who have migrated to the UK and the Gulf states in terms of its class and cultural capital. But among this group are also the persecuted Ahmadiyyas, declared non-Muslim in 1974, as well as illegal migrants, such as those depicted in Zinda Bahag, who take on poorly paid jobs, becoming taxi drivers, newspaper vendors, waiters, and petrol pump attendants, all having been lured by the American dream. In between the tectonic political shifts inside, Bangladesh 1971, and outside, 9-11, lay the Salman Rushdie affair of 1988-1989. Rushdie, whose magical realist novels related to Indian independence, Midnight's Children, 1981, and the creation of Pakistan, Shame, 1983, had touched these countries' sensitivities by taking on the life of the Prophet Muhammad in his fourth novel, The Satanic Verses, 1988. With a fatwa calling for his death issued by the supreme leader of Iran in February 1989, the novelist became the news himself, overtaking the contents of his book, which had been banned in both India and Pakistan. As Ziauddin Sadar remarked, looking back on the episode 20 years later, the Rushdie affair had no place for reasoned Muslim opinion. It was structured on the assumption that those who question or criticise Rushdie's right to say what he said are by definition barbarians. Thus the only valid Muslim opinion was the extremist one, 
and the only Muslim voices that could be heard were of those who supported the fatwa. This dynamic justified the perception that Islam represented, in Rushdie's words, the darkness of religion. This has presented a peculiar dilemma in Pakistan ever since, on themes such as internal reform, secularism, perpetual doubt, and above all, as Ziyadin Sadar asked, whether a single way of being Muslim can be a ray of light for all Muslims. These questions have no easy answers, and thus an escape, whether via pull or push factors, to wherever there is a potential for a better life abroad is an obvious attraction. More than the economic migrants, it is the individuals who are hounded or forced to flee for fear of persecution whose plight is disturbing. Among these have been journalists speaking against the state. Pakistan is 145 out of 180 in the World Press Freedom Index, 2020. And members of the dwindling minorities, most recently the Christian woman Asya Bibi, who was acquitted on blasphemy charges but sought asylum in France in 2020. Others on the peripheries of the homogenous society that is being forged include LGBTQ people. Although Pakistan's parliament passed a law in 2019 guaranteeing basic rights for transgender citizens, the social stigma attached to them in a discriminatory society leads to attacks, forcing many to seek sanctuary in the outside world. Sport, politics and social change If there is one thing which sounds the jingoistic trumpets in India and Pakistan, it is cricket. The most popular sport in South Asia, cricket provides entertainment, money, hero worship and villainy and manages to rouse the mildest of nationalists. Equally, to many, this spectacle is a vulgar travesty, a distraction from the structural poverty and inequality in the region, verily an opium of the masses. It has usurped the place of field hockey, the official national game, that formed the source of bragging rights between the 1950s and 1970s, especially at the Melbourne, 1956, Rome, 1960, and Tokyo, 1964, Olympic Games, when India and Pakistan contested three successive finals. Pakistan's last gold medal was won at Los Angeles, 1984, with the charismatic Hassan Sadar and the last medal, bronze, at Barcelona, 1992, under centre-forward Shahbaz Ahmed. In the same time span, Pakistan also had two world champions in Jahangir and Janta Khan in the game of squash. Cricket its popular one-day form, in addition to the classical five-day version, emerged as the leading sport from the late 1970s, and Pakistan, having co-hosted, with India, the World Cup in 1987, won the 1992 edition under the captaincy of Imran Khan. The colonial roots of cricket in South Asia cannot be overlooked, but the subcontinent, including Bangladesh and Sri Lanka, has made the game its own. Like the colonial rulers and their princely collaborators, cricket in British India remained a remote, urban and elite preserve up until the 1930s when India gained test status and a team toured England. In the aftermath of the Second World War, cricket resumed in late colonial India, soon to be overtaken by the partition disturbances. Afterwards, cricket ties were among the first to be resumed and a Pakistan team travelled to India in 1952 for its maiden test tour. In the next decade, the countries took turns to host each other, but a majority of these games were drawn, as neither side could either overpower the other, or, crucially, take risks to win, fearing a loss of face. This was still better than what followed between 1961 and 1978, when there was a complete stoppage of play between the two countries, as political relations deteriorated. Meanwhile, cricket's popularity continued in both countries, with PTV broadcasting matches from the late 1960s, paving the way for the more frenzied popular fan following that we associate with the game today. By 1978, the political climate had changed in both countries, and over the next five years, they regularly played each other. Ironically, it was the puritanical General Zia who most effectively used the idea of cricket diplomacy with his message of cricket for peace and journeying to Jaipur, India, in 1987 to watch a cricket match with the Indian Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi at a tense time of military standoff. Through the late 1980s and the 1990s, as bilateral tours endured another barren decade, Sharjah, UAE, emerged as the home away from home 
for the two teams, given its increasing expatriate population from the subcontinent. In between, in 1996, Pakistan again co-hosted, with India and Sri Lanka, a Cricket World Cup, and played its part in shifting the popular balance of power away from the traditional holders, the British White Commonwealth. The 1999 Pakistan trip to India came at a sensitive time, after the two countries had conducted their nuclear tests in 1998 and just before the Kargil War of summer 1999. Acting as an icebreaker, the game at least provided a forum for some people-to-people -people exchange. Sporting visas were issued. The years 2004 to 2008, when Pakistan and India played four back-to-back -back bilateral tours, now appear a golden age. Since the terrorist attack in Mumbai in November 2008, the two countries have only played each other on foreign soil. What has been most striking is how much of this rivalry has seeped through into the general body politic and how much the administration of the game oozes with state propaganda. Therefore, the rather lucrative Indian Premier League of the shortest, the most popular and heavily monetized version of the game has excluded Pakistani players since its inaugural season in early 2008. Indeed, since the attack on the Sri Lankan team in Lahore in March 2009, Pakistan went an entire decade without hosting the international cricket community. However, changes in attitudes are not limited to just this bilateral rivalry. The Pakistan team has also visibly changed, reflecting the wider transformation of society and the cultural landscape. The Pakistani journalist Nadim Farooq Paracha has argued that cricket culture reflects the wider socio-political mindset. Cricket has been more than a mere game for the colonised countries in the subcontinent, as in the Caribbean. Pakistan's first cricket captain was the Oxford-educated Abdul Hafiz Qadar. Initially, the players were mainly from the two leading cosmopolitan centres, Lahore and Karachi. There was no representation in the national team from East Pakistan, despite having the majority population. In the past 30 years, the players' pool has widened to smaller towns and provincial areas. One visible change over the years has been the players' public display of religiosity, most prominently exhibited and associated with the captaincy of Inzamon al haq 2003-2007. From being the preserve of Oxford Blues and the Lahori landed elite, mingled with street fighters from Karachi, half the cricket team were now connected with the revivalist millenarian Tablighi Jamaat movement. In 2008, it prompted a Pakistan journalist to write about the Islamization of Pakistani cricket. The Tablighi Jamaat's largely apolitical and humanitarian stance has proved to be particularly popular amongst the rising middle class in Pakistan. At the same time, its members wear their religiosity and mark their bodies and conduct accordingly. In 2006, the Pakistan Cricket Board was forced to issue a warning to the players about striking a balance between religion and cricket. By contrast, state endorsement and social excitement has been muted when it comes to women playing sports. Although numbers are small and their public profile limited, nevertheless, many women have been able to break the barriers despite the odds. In 1996, two young sisters, Shazia and Shamin Khan from Karachi, led the way in establishing a women's cricket team recognised by the Pakistan Cricket Board. Despite the backlash, which included death threats and court cases, the sisters cleared the path for the team's participation in the Women's World Cup in 1997. That women's cricket in Pakistan is much more accepted and has grown tremendously since was seen in the accolades that poured in on the retirement of former captain Sana Mir in 2020 after a 15-year international career as a premier all-rounder. But right-wing religious groups continue to target events such as the mixed marathon race in Gurdranwala in 2005, which gained much attention in Pakistan and abroad. Sporting bodies have since sought to accommodate the concerns of religious conservatives by following strict dress codes, having segregated training facilities and ensuring the safety of the players so that they can continue to participate in sports. Today. Nowhere is the motif of cricket in Pakistan more useful as a prism of social change than right at the very top, in the life and times of the present Prime Minister, Imran Khan. Born in 1952, Khan has roots from his maternal side that are now on the other side of the Radcliffe Line, 
in Jalandhar, India. He was born into a Pashtun family from Lahore, which already had cricket stars in his cousins, for example, Majid Khan. After schooling in England and an Oxford degree, Khan made his debut in Test cricket with the Pakistan team against England in June 1971, when Pakistan still had two wings, and would cap a glittering 21-year career by winning the 1992 Cricket World Cup. After raising money to establish the first cancer hospital in Pakistan in 1994, later his springboard into politics, he married into the Goldsmith family and established his political party, the PTI, in 1996. What followed was a slow and, to many, a shocking 22-year transformation from cricketing icon and playboy to pious philanthropist and conservative politician who finally reached the top, with some help along the way from the military establishment, in August 2018. The colonial legacies were very much in evidence in 1971 when Imran Khan took his first steps in international cricket, representing a country barely 25 years old. It is apt, in many ways, that another rebirth of Pakistan is now taking place on his watch, even if not entirely at his behest. Imran Khan, with his spiritual mentor spouse in Purdah, and his ever-visible rosary beads, represents this Naya Pakistan, which is youthful and restless, aspirational, but also directionless, seeking to break through old barriers of land, class, and caste, but also stymied by the military-industrial-religious complex. His successful conversion from a global icon to representing a narrowly defined nationalist Pakistan says more about the society in which he is embedded. Chapter 8 Looking Backwards, Going Forward When Imran Khan took office as Prime Minister of Pakistan in August 2018, he began his maiden address to the nation thus. There are two types of politics, one in which one would pursue his career, and the second, my role model, Qaeed Azam, Muhammad Ali Jinnah, who conducted politics for a mission that our Prophet Hazrat Muhammad brought revolution in the world's history by creating State of Medina, an Islamic welfare state envisioned by Alama Muhammad Iqbal, which have showcased in the Comity of Nations that what is real Islam. After invoking these three historical figures and tying them by the thread of Islam, he went on to sketch plans for his Naya Pakistan. In its 70th year, it seemed that the Islamic Republic of Pakistan had settled down to some kind of democratic pattern, or, as some political scientists have suggested, a hybrid regime. After seeing four spells of military rule in six decades, Pakistan had seen three successive elections since 2008. In these, a tripartite contest had been waged between the Pakistan People's Party of the Bhutos, the Sharif Brothers Pakistan Muslim League, Nawaz, and Imran Khan's Pakistan Tariqi Insaf, with each winning in turn. This sustained democratic spell has, though, been under the twin shadows of the military and the mullah, religious leader. Bedeviled by political violence, blighted by severe political corruption, and beset by a tight-knit biradari, brotherhood or kinship, public sphere, the people have drawn unity from, in the words of historian Faisal Devji, the idea of belonging to a land, rather than belonging to it in its present form. Much as the old Pakistan movement of the 1940s was in pursuit of a new Medina, so the new Pakistan of Imran Khan in 2020 seeks a Rayasati Medina, state of Medina. Jinnah's dream was powerful enough to become a reality, but it was also vague enough to be malleable in a disenchanting manner. As we have heard, weak institutions, lack of leadership, and above all, conflicting ideas about how to build the land of the pure, opened up space for rigid structures and harsh ideologies to thrive. Beneath and beyond them, over generations, the restless young oscillated between agitation for their hopes and accommodation, with the attendant danger of disillusionment born out of fear, insecurities and inequities. Straddling these social fault lines and personifying some, Imran Khan came into office in 2018 on the promise of eradicating big-ticket corruption, overhauling Pakistan's seriously debt-ridden financial problems and breaking away from the lifestyle of those in power. He sought help from the youth, the Pakistani diaspora and countries willing and able to help Pakistan, 
chiefly China and Saudi Arabia. What is new about Naya Pakistan? Is it simply old Pakistan that has been dressed up in a new outfit? Or has anything fundamental changed? While ultimately only time can tell, anthropologist Amara Maksud and historian Ali Usman Kazmi have noted one key societal change alongside structural continuity in Pakistan's new middle class, which seems to have broken away from its predecessor in three significant ways. First, it has become politically more active than previously when it was a passive observer and supporter of the military. Second, it has expanded considerably since the days of Zia, consolidating through the years of the Bhutto and Sharif premierships and gathering strength during nearly a decade of Musharraf's government. State, market-oriented economics remained the same through all three phases. Third, as its voice became further magnified in the emerging eco-chambers of social media, its socio-cultural ascendancy has been accompanied by a religious turn, one which, when yoked to nationalism, allowed the new middle class to shift away from the provincial client-patron networks of the older, feudal parties, and helped propel Imran Khan to prime ministerial office, if not to power. Among this ambitious class, and those aspiring to join their ranks, it is the youth, in particular, to whom Imran Khan owed his electoral victory in 2018. His old new popularity amongst them, combined with their frustration with the clannish political parties of the Sharifs and Bhuttos, allowed him to embark on his long Azadi, Freedom March, following claims of election rigging during the 2013 general election. According to a UN Development Programme, UNDP, report of 2018, 64% of the country's population is below the age of 30. His political rhetoric and ability to capture a sense of the historic resonated among millennials and post-millennials, many of whom were voting for the first time in 2018, resulting in a vote for change. Like populist leaders before him, and those elsewhere, he pinned his hopes for the nation and political fortune on the potential of the youth and the aspirational middle classes. For this support to materialise, however, poverty alleviation and social uplift policies are crucial. One third of Pakistan's population still lives under the poverty line, and it is ranked at 150 out of 189 in the latest UN Human Development Index. Yet its defence expenditure, one of the highest in the world, comfortably outweighs its commitment to education, which is one of the lowest. Indeed, on all major socio-economic indicators, from mortality to literacy rates, from access to clean water, sanitation facilities, healthcare to electricity supply, country-wide figures are less than flattering. And they are further skewed among the regions by the rural and urban divide and by the gender divide. Overall, according to UNDP, multidimensional poverty plagues Pakistani provinces some more than others, such as Fatah and Balochistan, but in all, between one-fourth and one-third of the population remains poor, and the situation is getting worse. This widening gap, keeping in mind that the young among the poor have only seen a post-Zia Pakistan, with its prominent military, all-permeating religion, and pervasive international and international conflicts, is the toughest of the intersectional challenges in Pakistan. All this makes for a resilient society, but also a restless one, seeking change. Regulating and monitoring dissent is a colonial inheritance in the region, and sedition laws of a different era have been carefully crafted to suit the purposes of the past 70 years. They are designed not just to detain protesters, but also to deter those who question authority. 35 years of military dictatorships and stop-start democratic infrastructure has at least led to a small, critical civil society. This group, generationally renewed by students and other young people, periodically bursts into life, as in that famous year of protest of 1968, when its uprising brought down the dictatorship of Ayub Khan in March 1969. Fifteen years later, in 1984, Zia banned student unions, no doubt fearing that history might repeat itself. As recently as 2018, a student solidarity march reawakened old state suspicions and resulted in some of the organisers being arrested. The group is an umbrella organisation that demands a reinstatement of student union elections, an increase in education investment 
and a lifting of the ban on students participating in political activities. Protest in Pakistan is, however, not owned by critical youth. Organizations like the JUI, F, split branch of Jamiat Ulema i Aslam, Assembly of Islamic Clerics, led by Fazul ur Rehman, a cleric politician who turned Imran Khan's brand of street march protest politics against him in 2019, and TTP, Tariki i Taliban, the Pakistan Taliban, an armed group that has engaged the Pakistani army along the Afghan frontier, continue to challenge the state. With the Muhajir fault line in Sindh, the nationalist fringe in Balochistan and students across campuses in the country, various aspirational voices demanding change from their perspectives and through various methods are agitating quietly and publicly, making effective use of social media. In Pakistan, this is dominated by Facebook, which has an overwhelming market share of 94%, 2020, compared to Twitter's paltry but no doubt rising figure of 4%. On the whole, though, active social media users number around a fifth of a population of 220 million, a figure that is only going to rise with smartphones enabling wider data connectivity. The use of new technologies presents challenges and opportunities, but it also exposes the gaps within society in terms of accessibility. Still, the trend here too is one way. In 2019, China Mobile Pakistan, CM Puk Limited, with its brand name Zong 4G, conducted Pakistan's first 5G tests, the first to do so in South Asia. Apart from the enhanced censorous attempt by the state to keep a watch on this increasing flow of information, the other limitations to an information revolution are societal, namely low literacy, financial, limiting access to technology, and cultural the overwhelmingly gendered nature of the virtual space, mirroring the public spaces. Women have lower rates of literacy, less ownership of mobile phones, and are less likely to use the internet. Naturally, this leads to fewer women being visible, let alone vocal. Women who do use the internet generally inhabit urban, elite or quasi-elite, upwardly mobile strata of society, and their usage is often for a different purpose. Among Pakistani women, social networking becomes socializing and keeping in touch with friends and family. In comparison, more men seem to use social media to gather information and project influence. Across South Asia, this discrepancy represents the still gendered, indeed newly gendered norms of educational opportunities, material autonomy, digital training and a discriminatory playing field. Greater access and usage of smartphones has also resulted in greater online surveillance. Data protection laws were weak to begin with, but the 2016 Prevention of Electronic Crimes Act brought regulation of the Internet. Its empowering of state authorities to gather and retain data has been seen as a weapon of mass surveillance, violating individual privacy, stifling civil liberties and encouraging self-censorship but these are existential matters for only a small top layer of society. Online trolling, the spread of misinformation and propaganda wars waged by self-appointed or state-manufactured social media warriors are further concerns. These are global conversations, and South Asia states are new players in the field. At the same time, all of this is also part of a cultural reimagining that continues in the more widespread medium of the small screen. With the continued ban on films and television programs from India, though those with access can watch these via online platforms, Pakistani audiences have been enthralled to Turkish productions. The popularity of programs such as Dirilish e Turul, a Turul's Resurrection, a historical drama based on the life of a 13th century Muslim whose son Osman Ghazi went on to establish the Ottoman Empire, is in turn utilized by Imran Khan's government for encouraging Islamic culture in contrast to what is perceived as morally questionable and Islamophobic entertainment from Hollywood and Bollywood. Such endorsements have reignited the old debate on what can be considered Pakistani history and culture. Equally, there is accompanying anxiety as to how these global or pan-Islamic projects envelop and dilute local cultures. 
The program has been accused of promoting violence, distorting history, and promoting a Turkish vision of pan-Islam, all of which ensured that it was banned in Saudi Arabia and the UAE. In Pakistan, such examples reinforce the shift to generally looking west, whether towards Turkey or the Gulf, for remaking Pakistani cultural identity, as opposed to the east, towards India, from which it has worked hard to divorce, distinguish, and distance itself. The pull towards India is diminishing rapidly, with reduced interpersonal contact, especially since the two successive electoral victories of the fiercely Hindu nationalist Bharatiya Janata Party in India, the passing away of a generation with shared histories and memories, and the loosening of the threads of Hindustani language and pan-North Indian culture. The links with Turkey, in any case, extend beyond cultural and religious kinship. Turkey was one of the first countries to recognize Pakistan in 1947, and, ironical in light of current goings-on, Jinnah looked to Mustafa Kemal Atatürk's secular Turkey as a model to emulate, a design that was also briefly revived by General Musharraf. More recently, the first Metrobus to be built in Pakistan, in Lahore, inaugurated in 2013, was a collaborative project between the Punjab and Turkish governments. While both Pakistan and Turkey have turned away from those mid-20th century ideals of a modernizing and secularizing Islamic Republic, this has opened up other possibilities for pan-religious and populist nationalist inspirations. Meanwhile, in a bid to make Pakistan attractive to the outside Western world, the government has taken to promoting tourism with the aim of changing the country's international image from terrorism to tourism and making it an attractive tourist destination. The security situation today is comparatively more stable than the period 2009 to 2014, one of intense activity by the Pakistan Taliban. Under successive army chiefs since Musharraf, Ashfaq Parvez Kayani and Rahil Sharif, the military and the ISI, Inter-Services Intelligence, launched operations like Rahi Rast in Sawat and Zabi Azb in Waziristan. From Karachi to Khyber and from Huila to Wahab, Pakistan remains a country of many difficulties and conflicts, but its hard image is being softened. Behind the motivation to change Pakistan's image lies the dire economic situation, the declining value of the Pakistani rupee, and the billions of dollars owed to the International Monetary Fund. Lifting visa restrictions and enabling electronic visas, along with a few well-placed foreign tourists to publicize brand Pakistan, are the latest government initiatives in this direction. The slow growth between 2014 and 2020 has been pegged back by the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, but there is no denying the appeal and potential benefits of this attempt. First, it seeks to capitalize on Pakistan's still unspoilt beauty in its northern areas, Khyber Pakhtunwa and Gilgit Baltistan, by trying to re-establish some of the old, 1960s, hippie trails, encouraging mountaineering and trekking in the Hindu Kush range, and expanding on establishments like the Malam Jaba Ski Resort, dating from the 1980s in Sawat Valley, much of which had been destroyed in 2008 by the Pakistan Taliban, after being declared un-Islamic. Geologically, northern Pakistan is located on an active fault line where the Indian and Eurasian tectonic plates meet, making it highly prone to earthquakes. In October 2005, an earthquake of 7.6 magnitude, with its epicenter at Balakot, devastated Azad, Jammu and Kashmir and surrounding areas. It was one of the deadliest earthquakes in recent times, with an estimated death toll of 75,000 to 85,000 people. Relatedly, in July 2010, the Indus River Valley saw flash floods following a record-breaking monsoon, which brought untold misery to over a million people across all the major provinces who were displaced. These environmental challenges remain, especially given climate change, but equally important is the need to create an eco-friendly and sustainable infrastructure. The second strand of tourism is multidimensional, people-oriented, and has a diplomatic value. Three kilometers away from the India-Pakistan border, in Pakistani Punjab, is the Gadwara in Katapur, the final resting place of Guru Nanak, founder of the Sikh faith. On the other side, in Indian Punjab, is the bustling holy town of Dera Baba Nanak, 
again associated with the life and times of the Guru. In November 2018, the governments of India and Pakistan took the momentous step of opening a corridor between these two Gadvaras to enable visa-free travel for pilgrims, a long-standing desire of the Sikh communities of both countries. The development of this corridor was completed in time to mark the 550th birth anniversary of Guru Nanak in 2019. The Sikh community is concentrated in the Indian Punjab, but some of the most significant shrines associated with the faith are located in Pakistani Punjab, another sad outcome of India's partition. In recent times, these have been renovated to attract Sikh pilgrims from the diaspora and also from India too, but with the latter being at the mercy of the fluctuating relationship between the two governments. The Qatarpur Corridor is therefore the kind of spiritual tourism that the Pakistan government is keen to promote because it also shows the state in a positive light vis-à-vis -vis its minorities, in addition to generating capital. However, by recreating these links with the Sikhs, the Pakistani state also runs the risk of reopening old accusations of propping up the Sikh separatist Khalistan movement in India and abroad. On the other hand, in 2019, a statue of Maharaja Ranjit Singh, 1780-1839, was installed near Lahore Fort as a tribute to that Sheri Punjab as a son of the soil. Soon, perhaps not entirely unsurprisingly, it was subjected to vandalism, revealing the difficulty of untying the threads of religion, nation and region. But the issue of minorities, their political representation, inclusion in the national narrative and place in the history of Pakistan continues to be central to the question, who is a Pakistani? This is especially important because the pool of people to choose from continues to shrink. Overall, across the post-colonial world, a relative lack of political stability, due to both external and internal factors, and historic and new, has hampered economic growth and social development in Pakistan. The country has weathered many storms and remains resilient, if slightly worn and fraying at the edges. Pakistan today may not be the promised land to which many fled in August 1947, but after more than 70 years, it is certainly not a people without history, as the historian Faisal Devji suggests. That history, though, continues to be reworked and reimagined for a younger audience. The older, and some would argue more inclusive, memories have given way to newer and more exclusionary ambitions. Timeline and Key Moments 1875 Mohammedan Anglo-Oriental College established in Aligarh 1906 All India Muslim League established in Dakar 1920 MAO College, Aligarh, upgraded to Aligarh University 1930 Muhammad Allama Iqbal gives his Allahabad speech suggesting the creation of a separate Muslim state 1933. Chowdhury Ramad Ali's pamphlet outlining a state of Pakistan. 1940. AIML passes the Lahore Resolution, dubbed the Pakistan Resolution and Two-Nation Theory. 1947. 14th of August. Partition of British India and creation of East and West Pakistan. 1948. September. The founding father, Qaid -e Azam, dies. 1948. First war with India over disputed territory of Kashmir. 1949. Objectives resolution by PM Liaquat Ali Khan is passed. 1951. October. PM Liaquat Ali Khan assassinated. 1956. Pakistan becomes an Islamic Republic. 1958. October. Martial law declared by General Ayub Khan. 1965. Fatima Jinnah loses the presidential elections. Ayub completes the second term. Second war with India over disputed territory of Kashmir. 1967. Pakistan People's Party, founded by Zulfikar Ali Bhutto. 1969. Ayub Khan resigns and General Yahya Khan becomes president. 1970. November. Devastating Bola cyclone in East Pakistan. Estimated 500,000 deaths. 1970. 
first democratic elections held in December, delayed due to Bola. East Pakistan's Awami League wins. 1971. Yahya Khan resigns. Civil war in East Pakistan, which turns into an Indo-Pakistan war. Secession of Bangladesh. 1972. Similar agreement with India sets new line of control in Kashmir. 1973. Zulfika Ali Bhutto becomes PM. 1974. Ban on Ahmadiyya calling themselves Muslims. 1977. General Zia ul Haq declares martial law. 1979. April. Zulfika Ali Bhutto hanged. Zia enacts the Hadood ordinances. Abdus Salam becomes the first Pakistani to be awarded the Nobel Prize for Physics. 1985. Martial law and ban on political parties lifted. 1986. Banazir Bhutto returns to Pakistan from exile to lead the PPP. 1988. August. General Zia dies in a plane crash. November. Benazir Bhutto's PPP wins general election. 1990. Bhutto dismissed on charges of corruption and incompetence. Nawaz Sharif becomes PM. 1992. Pakistan win Cricket World Cup under Imran Khan's captaincy. 1993. Sharif forced to resign. Fresh elections bring Bhutto back to power. 1996. Bhutto government dismissed by President Lekhari amid corruption charges. 1997. February. Sharif returns to power after PML wins elections. 1998. Chagai 1. First nuclear tests by Pakistan performed in Chagai district, Balochistan. 1999. May. Kargil war in Indian-held Kashmir. October. General Pervez Musharraf seizes power in a military coup. 2000. Nawaz Sharif sentenced to life imprisonment on hijacking and terrorism charges over his actions in the 1999 coup. 2001. July. Agra summit starts. Musharraf and Indian PM Vajpayee hold talks. 2001. September. Musharraf backs the USA in its fight against terrorism. USA lifts some sanctions imposed after Pakistan's nuclear tests in 1998. 2002. First general elections since the 1999 military coup. 2003. Pakistan and India agree to resume direct air links after a two-year ban. 2005. First bus service in 60 years operates between Muzaffarabad in Pakistani-administered Kashmir and Srinagar in Indian-controlled Kashmir. October. Earthquake in Balakot and Asad Jammu and Kashmir with an estimated death toll of 75,000 people. 2007. March. Musharraf suspends Chief Justice Chowdhury, sparking a wave of protests. 2007. Benazir Bhutto returns to Pakistan after eight years' exile and Sharif returns after seven years' exile. Emergency lifted. Banned civil rights and suspended constitution restored. Bhutto assassinated in December in Rawalpindi at a political rally. 2008. Yusuf Raza Gilani, PPP, becomes PM at head of coalition with Nawaz Sharif's PML, N, following parliamentary elections in February. August. Musharraf resigns after the two main governing parties agree to launch impeachment proceedings against him. 2008. Mumbai attacks in November. India hold Pakistan-based Lashkari Taiba, an extremist terror organization, responsible. 2009. Sri Lankan cricket team attacked by militants in Lahore. All international cricket matches in Pakistan are suspended. Pakistan loses its status as hosts for the Cricket World Cup 2011. 2010. Parliament approves constitutional reforms. 18th Amendment transfers key powers from the President to the Prime Minister. 2011. Campaign to reform Pakistan's blasphemy law leads to the killing of Punjab Governor Salman Taseer in January and Minorities Minister Shahbaz Bhatti in March. 2011. May. Osama bin Laden is killed by American special forces in Abbottabad. 2012. Taliban gunmen attack a group of girls including Malala Yousafzai. 2012. 
Shamin Abaid Chinoy becomes the Pakistani Academy Award winner for Best Documentary Short Subject for Saving Face. 2013. PMLN wins parliamentary elections in May. Nawaz Sharif returns as PM. 2013. Suicide bombing at All Saints Church, walled city of Peshawar. 127 killed. 2014. Malala Yousafzai becomes the youngest person ever to win the Nobel Peace Prize. 2014. Taliban gunmen attack Army Public School in Peshawar, killing 148 people, mostly children. 2015. China and Pakistan sign CPEC agreements worth billions of dollars. 2017. Suicide bombing inside the shrine of Lal Shahbaz Kalanda in Sehwan, Sindh, a major Sufi shrine. The Islamic State claims responsibility for the death of 90 people. 2017. March. Parliament passes a law allowing the country's Hindu minority to register their marriages for the first time since partition from India in 1947. PM Sharif is forced to resign after being disqualified by the Supreme Court over corruption charges. He is convicted and given a jail sentence. 2018. General elections in July. Imran Khan, PTI, becomes Prime Minister on a pledge to end corruption and dynastic politics. 2018. Asia Bibi, a Christian woman acquitted of blasphemy after eight years on death row, is freed from prison, prompting violent protests by Islamists. This concludes Pakistan by Pippa Verdi, narrated by Shakira Shute. Copyright 2021 by Pippa Verdi. This unabridged audiobook is published by arrangement with Oxford University Press and was produced in the year 2022 by Tantor Media Incorporated, a division of recorded books, which holds the copyright thereto. Please visit tantor.com for more information on our growth.